At what point is the private sector willing to pay to do what needs to be done in the region? We have a diet of limitations, but not a sufficient discourse on our possibilities. This is a critical step in our regional integration process. Mistrust within countries is defeating us. It's not an economic matter. That is a matter for mindset. West Indian people, we are a gem. Let's advance our partnership together through the region. Let us organize and do that together. We need to ensure that there's transparency in what we do. I do it because I love it. I'm passionate about watching things grow. If there's a will, you will find a way to make it happen. I'm David Jessup, the Director of the Caribbean Council and the moderator uh, of this session. Uh, and this session perhaps is unlike the sessions that we had this morning. This is a, uh, one of two sessions where perhaps you could say the rubber hits the road because this is about the practical end uh, of exporting. Uh, and in this session we'll actually look at some case studies. And you'll be pleased to know perhaps having sat through this morning, this will also be uh, an interactive session because after uh, our participants have spoken, uh, there'll be an opportunity for you uh, to ask questions or make points uh, or comments. Uh, I just might like to make a few points uh, by way of introduction. Um, this morning, um, we heard a lot about problems, but we did also hear about some, some bright spots. Uh, I was interested that Sasha Silva uh, actually itemized about half a dozen areas where uh, Caribbean exports are succeeding. Um, just to take some at random, he talked about Dominican Republic and agriculture. He talked about uh, the rum industry across the board. Um, he also talked about uh, mining uh, and, and other opportunities. And I think uh, there was a very interesting presentation from Minister Hilton as well, who talked about much broader changing opportunity for the Caribbean in terms of it perhaps becoming uh, a logistics hub. Uh, and then Minister Pinder made a very interesting uh, uh, series of remarks where he talked about opportunities for looking at uh, the region uh, in an interregionally way um, as being able to move up the value chain uh, through production and logistic structures that change to manufacture for external markets. Well, this session um, is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one that is meant to be practical uh, with a focus on export-led growth. So. Without more ado, because I'd actually like to leave as much time as possible, not just for the speakers, but also for you uh, to intervene after they've spoken, let me introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Alvin Henderson, the Managing Director of the Royal Mayan Shrimp Farms Limited. So, Alvin. Pleasant afternoon, everyone. We are supposedly a population in the world of 7 billion people. The estimate is that by the year 2030, we will be at 9 billion. No, wait a minute. Try maximum 50 years, perhaps, I mean 2050. Maximum 2050, we are supposed to be at about 9 billion. We have a significant challenge emerging here. It has to do with food security. Now, Food security is a concept that perhaps we've talked about quite a bit in the Caribbean. And maybe, arguably, there are two ways of looking at food security. We can look at food security in terms of our ability to provide for ourselves, i.e. all of our basic food being consumed or being produced in our country. Another way of looking at food security is our ability to pay. If you cannot produce it yourself, you have to be able to buy it. Now, I raise, make that observation because that therein, therein lies inherently a problem. If we're not producing it and we can't afford it, then we have a problem, don't we? Nine billion people, how are we going to feed them? I was at a function three weeks ago in Washington, hosted by the World Wildlife Fund. And in the room were people from Cargill, people from ADM. Of course, you know these names as companies that are involved in the food business and major producers at that. Coca-Cola was present. And Dr. Jason Clay from the World Wildlife Fund made a profound observation that has left an indelible impression on my mind. He said to them, you see, you know what? Any of you in this room can be acquired. Any of you can be acquired by China simply because 
While many of our economies and countries are very indebted, China sits on a substantial foreign reserve of $3 trillion. I'm watching with an amazing level of interest a transaction that seems so remote from all of us. It's something that's going on as I speak in Peru. In Peru, there's a company called Copin, Copina. Yeah. They're a producer of fish meal and fish oil. It may seem unimportant to us. Copinca is the name of the company. It's important for this reason. They are the second largest producer of fish meal and fish oil in Peru. 60% of what they produce goes into China. Fish meal and fish oil is very critical to the aquaculture industry that I'm a part of, and all of us need it. Even the company that I buy food from, Concentrated Meal, for the shrimp, actually is based in Guatemala, but they're sourcing fish meal from, from Peru. Why is China interested in this company? Very interested. There's a company out of China that has made a bid after this company, hostile takeover, the last bidding was $556 million. The people who own the company then countered and tried to get other people in, interested in the bid. It's ongoing. I am curious to see who will win this. Now, what is this about? This is really about control of raw material. That's what it's about. Raw material input into the aquaculture process. Why? China is the largest producer of shrimp in the world. 16 months ago, they became a net importer of shrimp. The largest exporter of shrimp in the world is actually Thailand. Isn't that interesting? Thailand has a major disease problem right now. Their production is 30% down, and world prices are going all over the place. I've been in this business for 13 years, and prices are shooting in a way I've seen in a long time. Where is my presentation? It's supposed to be somewhere up. Aha! Thank you very much. So, I farm. I don't look like a farmer today, but I farm. We're located. I put this map up for a reason. I put it up because... Understanding our geographic location is important. We have Mexico to the north. I trade heavily in Mexico. I also will begin to export this month into Guatemala. That's besides other markets that we also export to, but I'll cover that. It's important because Mexico, Guatemala in our case, is a significant input into the process that we do on shrimp farming. I use over 100 containers of feed per year. It all comes from Guatemala. We, we farm in the southern part of the country. The southern part of the country is down on this side is where we will be farming, near the Placencia area is where we farm. Uh, size of the country, 8,867 square miles. Belize is pretty large compared to most of the Caribbean islands. Um, of course, tourism, agriculture are main industries. We started operating in 2000. I'm not a newcomer to this. I've been in this for 13 years, and I've seen the ups and downs. A few years ago in the global downturn, I will tell people I've never sailed so close to the wind in my life. Forget the wind in your hair. I have none. I felt the salt in my eyes. Production area, 350. The write-up says 330, but where's David? Since he and I last spoke, we've commissioned 30 more acres. So we have 350 acres, or 141 hectares, for those who like the conversion. 1,500 metric ton per year is what we produce. Markets, we export to Mexico, to the United States, to Europe, the Caribbean. 85% of what we produce is, is on a head, what is called a head-on, shell-on uh, format. I'll explain that. Our densities, we do two stocking densities, 32 animals per square meter and 60 animals per square meter in what is called a more intensive area. Production per acre would be about 3,000 pounds per acre in the semi-intensive, 6,000 pounds per acre in the more intensive area. We produce shrimp all year round. We have a weather advantage. Belize is blessed with wonderful infrastructure. And this applies not only to this particular area in agriculture, but other areas as well. This is a modern processing plant that is owned by one of the farms in Belize. And this is the variety of items that we can produce out of this plant. And this is significant because this allows me and allows all of us to enter into market segments that are very sophisticated just because of the technology that we have in the plant. I'm covering this so I could provide some background. Markets, markets of color. Color is very important in our business. And depending on color, it influences what market you can go to. The color scheme, we go into US, I'll explain to you what that means. It has to do with this. Darker color, these colors are normally for the European market. This color, interestingly enough, A2, A3, light A3 is what is used in the Caribbean. Caribbean presence, it's a lighter color shrimp. It doesn't matter, once you cook, this is a raw product, but once it's cooked, it will be lighter anyway. This would be an A2 color. I'm mentioning that because it influences how you sell. Um, A3, A4 in the European market. 
defining your competitive space in a global marketplace. Jim Collins, I noticed that we're doing a presentation, Caribbean Export is doing a presentation on, on, on Jim Collins. I have read Built to Last, but this book, Good to Great, I found quite intriguing. And for those of you who are involved in business here, this is a must read. I read this book three times before I had an, a major epiphany regarding how to position certain things, items that we produce in our company. And that epiphany for me was so critical in breaking into markets that I couldn't quite figure out. Good, good to great is, is, I think, a required reading. There's a concept that he has in there called the hedge, hedgehog concept. So these concepts are from him. What we can be the best at in the world. Defining this is extremely important when you start accessing um, other markets. It's extremely important to know exactly what that is. Ecuador has over 160,000 hectares under production. These are massive operators. They're the largest producer in our region. Uh, they're the largest exporter, I should say, in our region. And one of their major product offerings is this very product that we produce, one of our products called a head on shell product. But understanding the structure of that industry in Ecuador has been important to me to understand how to position product to compete against them. They have five major processing plants, 160,000 hectares. Imagine this, five major processing plants. They have a problem. Many of the farms have small processing plants that they do the heading, but in terms of head-on, shell-on processing, they have very limited capacity. So I go after very markets that they go after because they have a problem delivering quality with consistency. A problem I don't have. You know why? Many times you have several farmers going into one processing plant. The trick with head-on, shell-on pro um, processing is 15 hours. Time and temperature will kill you. If you cannot process in 15 hours, you will not get a head-on quality. It's very, very critical. And that piece of information was critical to me to understand high quality, head-on product destined for niche markets. What drives our economic engine? Defining this, that, that driver behind the economic engine for me was a, was a significant thing as well. If you're involved in a, in, a, in a small business, no matter your size, it's important to define that element. Now, we operate in so many different product formats. I go head on shell on, I've been in Europe, France, Italy, Spain. I go head on shell on that market. I go head on shell on in the US market. I go easy peel, uh, IQF in the US market. It's a value added item. But you know what? I go fresh on ice into Mexico, a product that is consumed within 36 hours. That, that's a premium product, fresh on ice, never frozen. You know what people will pay for stuff like that? It's amazing, especially in Mexico, certain parts of the year. They pay a mint for it. But you know what? How do I then take all of the, the, this noise away to try to figure out the signal? How do I make sense of this? It's understanding the simple concept, profit per pound of shrimp at the farm gate. No matter how sophisticated the production process is, the processing is, it doesn't matter to me. I strip all of, the, all of that away, and I figure, what is my profit per pound at the farm gate? And once I had that epiphany, all of the rest of it was a lot clearer. What you're deeply passionate about, for me, it is a high, producing a high quality product. I'll tell you something that is almost shameful, but I'll make the confession here. I just got into the Caribbean two and a half years ago. I never looked at this market. Amazing, huh? Guys, I was in the US by the year 2000, heavy presence in the US. 2003, we started moving fresh product into Mexico. 2006, we started flirting in the Caribbean market in France, which for me was very interesting because they're very sophisticated. Um, came into the Caribbean two and a half years ago, and I'll share that story before I finish on how we started that. It was absolutely amazing to me. You know what, though? Sourcing product from Belize. This region's Caribbean sourcing product from Belize makes a lot of sense. Because when I look at how our buyer was sourcing product, and I showed him the price point that I could give him, he was completely blown away. By sourcing in the Caribbean, it was far cheaper than what he was sourcing. He just didn't know. And actually, neither did I. Use appropriate technology. I cannot emphasize this enough. On the very same infrastructure, we have gone from 1.4, 1, 1, 1.5 million pounds, 1.8 million pounds, 2.4 million pounds, we're going to do 3.3 million pounds this year. On the same infrastructure, it was a matter of understanding technology. Nursery system, nursery system, this right here. Nursery system allowed the company, our company, to double production without a CapEx program. Nursery works like this. So the, the PLs come from the, the hatchery. They're placed into a nursery system, 
and after 30 days, we transfer them out into the production pond. Well, by doing that, you engage in really a concept of nat natural selection. The animals that will not survive die in the nursery. And so, when you seed a pond and you expect 60,000 pounds from the pond, because of the nursery system, you can be assured that that's what you'll get. You see, in, for those who fly, you cannot co recover runway behind you or altitude above you. The point is, if you seeded a pond and you weren't sure of what you seeded, you could have produced 60,000 pounds and you produced 30. How do you recover time? You can't. The nursery system allowed us to cure that problem. Inventory management. Think of this. Inventory management is very, very critical. If any of you are in a, in some, into manufacturing, especially if you're in the importing business, you go to the bank, you have an overdraft, the overdraft is a million dollars, nothing is moving. The banker gets concerned, Alvin, what's up? Your overdraft is not moving, what's going on? He said, no, don't worry. Sales are a little bit slow. Give me a month, come by and you'll see. The banker is not sleeping at night, so he finally shows up at your place. He says, you know, Alvin, let me see this inventory, please. I can't sleep. So come. Take him to the work, to, to the warehouse, the bodega, show him all of your inventory, and he says, yeah, it's there. He goes home and he can sleep that night. Think of what I do. Think of what I do. We take 2.5 million pails, perhaps this size, and introduce them into a pond. And then, months later, you know if you have them. So, I developed this system that I call inventory management. When we buy PLs, we have our people go to the hatchery and count. And then we put them in a nursery system for 30 days. We transfer them out of this nursery system and we do a physical count. We weigh, we check our average size. Guys, this is intensive. Then we introduce them into the ponds. Now, this is where it gets bruising. I am never off, we are never off on our production estimate by more than 5%. And over a million pounds, over three million pounds, never. You know why? Because beyond what I just described, we also engage in a very bruising process of using statistical analysis to determine our biomass. Traditionally, across the world, in this industry, you use feed consumption to determine what your biomass is. I don't. I use a, a statistical analysis. But here it, how, it's, how it's done. And I did it myself, my production manager and I. Four o'clock in the morning, we used to go into the farm, into a pond, we'd do 100 throws on a pond. You do your average capture, a square meter each throw. Of course, you should see our cast net guys. They're just proficient. They're very, very good at this. Run our standard deviations. We were able to determine statistically what we have. You see what I mean, guys? If you want to have accurate system, you have to spend the time. I just don't, you know why I do this? Because inventory management is so critical in our business. Feed conversion will kill you. Feed conversion is the amount of feed you apply to the biomass you gain. So if I produce a million pounds, I use 1.5 million pounds of feed. You with me? That's an extremely important element. Why? Because feed is 40 to 50% of my production cost. You go after it aggressively. You know your number. You can't be guessing. You have to know. Aeration system allowed the company to drive down feed costs, increasing farm survival rate and production. Again, it has to do with opportunity cost. If I seed the animals directly into the pond, and I don't go through the nursery ponds, and I get 65% survival, a pond I could have produced 80,000 pounds, I'm producing 70. I could have produced 80 had I known what I had, what I had in the pond. You have to know. Once you can control your survival rate, you can then control also your FCRs. Develop a diversified market position. I cannot emphasize this enough. Guys, I got caught in a downturn, and I jokingly made the point of uh, sailing close to the wind. I know what that is been in this business for 13 years. Anybody who's involved in agriculture will tell you it's bruising. Bruising. Especially when you're on the commodity end the way I am. I, in, when the global downturn came, I was caught completely flat-footed. Guys, I know the textbook. I, I went and I studied that. I still got caught stuck in the Mexican market and I was not able to move on a dime. And I took a licking. We lost a lot of money because I didn't have a diversified market position. Just this past year, I had a contract with a company in Europe and midstream, the company tells me that they're going to reduce the price. And I told them, look, I've, I've been working with these guys for many years. I said, guys, I'm not accepting your price change. I said, but Alvin, sorry, the market. I said, fine. Since you are not going to accept, you don't want to give the price we agreed on, I will move markets. In two weeks, I moved that product into the U.S. market. You have to be able to move on a dime. You have to have a diversified market position. If you don't have that, you're, very risk you, you, you're putting the, uh, your strategy at risk. Regional governments to consummate trade agreements. I think there, there were these conversations uh, talking about a more macro level. Those kinds of conversations were had earlier today. 
I think that trade framework is extremely important. I was at a trade show in um, Asia last year, and I was watching these the Central American countries, um, Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, they were all, no, Costa Rica wasn't there, Panama was there. They were making some amazing presentations about all of the, the, the trade agreements they had consummated. Why is that so important? Because think of it, if you want to um, attract um, foreign, direct, uh, uh, foreign investment, you have to have the infrastructure. People don't look at a population of 100,000, what's that? Population of 330,000 in the case of Belize, what is that? It's nothing. But you create the trade infrastructure when people realize I can use that as a beachhead and go into other markets. That is extremely important. And of course, you cannot have a diversified market position, being able to move on a dime if you don't have the trade infrastructure. Partner with companies that can capitalize on what you're best at. I'll share a story. I'm almost done. I want to share a story. Um, two and a half years ago, I had a guy from uh, Trinidad exchanging emails with me about moving product into Trinidad. Guys, I get these often enough. But I sent him an email just to try to see what his response. His response was very, very technical. And I told my guys, this guy is serious. So I said, come, why don't you come to Belize? The guy hopped on a plane in two days and came to Belize. I was completely blown away by his, uh, how aggressive and assertive he was. And that began an incredible relationship. He came, we harvested. I took him around and I introduced him to all the farmers. I told him, I can't sell you product. I'm selling into, the, into Mexico. He came to me one night, he said, Alvin, please. He said, I don't, the other farmers don't want to sell to me. Why don't you sell to me? I called a Mexican buyer and I said, fine, I'll sell you the product. Aligning yourself with people who have shared values and who understand the business. So we shipped our first container into Trinidad. Partner with companies in other markets that can capitalize on what you're best at in the world. Guys, we're very good at head-on shell-on. I've had a lot of experience doing it. We're the largest producer of head-on shell-on product in Belize. We have a lot of experience. It's very complex because you have to manage the process very, very carefully. You know, a headless shell-on product, but it's de-headed, somebody can save you in the plant if you mess it up at the harvest. Head-on is not like that. If you mess up in the, in the, at the, pro, at the um, farm level, no, nobody can help you in the processing plant. This guy's interest was head-on. So, he came to Belize. I told him, come with me. We harvested at the farm. He went to, I dropped him off at the hotel at one o'clock, went to the processing plant the following day. Long story short, I shipped the first container into Trinidad. He called me, he said, Alvin, you wouldn't believe what happened. I said, what? He said, one of my largest buyers, remember he had been in the business, he was buying stuff from the trawlers, he was buying stuff from Venezuela, and eventually came to Belize. He said, I invited this guy, that was my largest buyer. He came and he said, you're a product from Belize? I said, yeah. He said, give me 25 pounds. So the guy took 25 pounds of the product, taught it out, called him, and asked for 10,000. Guys, I share that story because we have a very significant presence in the Trinidad market. We move about 800,000 pounds into that market alone. The market we developed two and a half years ago. I just came from Trinidad, meeting with our buyer, because we're going after other market segments. You cannot dominate, I don't care what business you're in, you, it's, it's virtually impossible to dominate all segments. Markets have many segments, but I, we dominate one segment and I saw an opportunity to go to another segment and I said, let's do it together. But guys, of course, Product for the Mexican market. You like my little design there? This product is a lot redder. This is what would be sold into Mexico. Thank you very much. Alvin, thanks so much I mean, for your enthusiasm and bringing everything back to life again. Uh, and, and also making clear that the, the interregional market is just as important potentially as the export market. Now, our next speaker is Ray Chiatao, Chief Executive Officer of Banks Holdings.